today we want to talk about scriptural doctrine and the psychology of deception. Thank you so much, Tim. You know, as we've said a number of times, and I'm sorry if I'm boring people by repeating it yet again, we're three-dimensional beings, body, soul, and spirit, because we are imagio dei beings, made in God's image and likeness. We have a body because God has a body in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus, God becoming a man. We have a spirit because God has a spirit, the Holy Spirit, that searches the depths of God. And we have a mind because God has a mind, or as it were, a soul who has known the mind of the Father. We are three-dimensional, while secular psychology based on Darwinism makes us two-dimensional. Again, the proverbial apes with better DNA. Um, we are degraded by Darwinistic thinking into two-dimensional beings, but the scripture says we are three-dimensional beings, and as we have explained on multiple teachings, God breathed on Adam, and he became a living soul. What we are in our consciousness, what we are in our soul, the breath, the Greek word to do with suke comes from the word for spirit, breath, pneuma. So with soma is body, suke, we get the word psychology or psyche, is our mind, our consciousness. But then there's the spirit, the pneuma. In Hebrew, it is guf, it is nefesh, nefesh, anamanopia in Hebrew, the breathing sound, and ruach, ruach. We are three, body, soul, and spirit. Secular psychology makes us two. Secular psychology sees the spiritual dimension of man, usually along the lines of something like Carl Jung's collective unconscious, which he makes a function of the soul, not realizing the spirit is different than the soul. What we are spiritually is as different from what we are psychologically and emotionally as what we are emotionally and psychologically is from our fingernails or our hair. It's completely different, except that what we are psychologically is a hybrid of what we are physically, organically, chemically, and what we are spiritually. God breathed on Adam. He became a living soul. The scriptures say, that everything that has breath praise the Lord in the Psalms. Well, they have breath, but they don't have a living soul, an eternal soul. We do because we're made in the image and likeness of our Creator. We have a living soul. Now, this, of course, goes against those who teach the errors of annihilationism. Those who go, who teach the errors of annihilationism, some of them deny this. We have a living soul. So there's three aspects of man. If somebody has a behavioral abnormality, as we pointed out many times, mental illness never comes from the mind. There's either something chemically wrong with someone, organically, physically, or there's something spiritually wrong, or some combination of the two. But mental illness never comes from the mind. Psychology, clinical psychology, is a pseudoscience. If somebody is experiencing behavioral abnormalities, as a side effect of a drug, a medication, or because of a hormonal imbalance, thyroidism, or something of this nature, um, postpartum depression. There is a chemical reason, a chemical reason for the behavioral abnormality. Now, a neuropsychologist, a biopsychologist, they understand the relationship between physiology and behavior. So if you have someone with behavioral abnormality that's hormonally induced or induced by some other chemical cause, a psychiatrist being a medical doctor, being a physician, can actually diagnose it. A psychologist cannot. A psychologist doesn't do blood chemistries. A psychologist doesn't understand medical physiology in the way or to the degree that a proper physician would. First, you become a physician, then you become a psychiatrist. Psychology is a pseudoscience. It is not grounded in quantitative science. It's not grounded in chemistry, biology, and physics. It's a false science. But it is also a false theology. Now, that's not to say that it cannot recognize certain truths. It can, but it just can't explain them. It can't explain them either physiologically, organically, Neither can it explain them spiritually. Let's begin looking at this subject today. 
The Psychology of Deception. We're going to look at three phenomena recognized by secular psychologists and sociologists. They all recognize it, people who are not even Christians. Cognitive dissonance, the Donington-Kruger effect, and functional autonomy. Cognitive dissonance, the Donington-Kruger effect, and functional autonomy. Now, sociologists and psychologists recognize these things. They know what they are. They can even functionally define them. But they don't understand what is causing such things, really. They think they do, but they do not. Let's look at cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is what happens when people have two conflicting beliefs simultaneously, and they choose the one that appears to be the most convenient, where they have two conflicting beliefs, and they choose the one, usually out of some kind of insecurity or fear, that appears to be the most convenient. What is this cognitive dissonance? Well, we see it multiple times in multiple ways. Let's begin in the realm of what's happening today, the narrative. Let's look at what's happening um, with, with, with um, President Trump's inauguration and people boycotting or things like that. The narrative is based on identity politics. Oh, if you don't vote for Hillary Clinton, it's because you're a sexist. You've got a problem with women. You're a misogynist. That was the narrative. Now, the fact that 53% of white American women and 26% of Hispanic American women, more than one out of four Latinos in the United States, and twice as many African American women voted for Donald Trump as voted for Mitt Romney, that doesn't fit the narrative. We're going to ignore those facts. Because if we come to term with those facts, it's going to threaten our presupposition, our identity politics. No, we have to go back. She lost because she's a woman. She lost because you know, of race, and the people who, who, who are white supremacists didn't want a candidate endorsed by Obama who's going to consider Obama's policies. Or if you oppose Barack Obama, it's because you're a racist. These people, of course, follow an Alenskyist agenda. So Alenski basically said that if you can't argue the point, just keep yelling race. Now, this is Goebbels. This is Hitler's propaganda minister. Repeat the lie often enough until people believe it's the truth. At least many people believe it's the truth. This is dangerous. But they don't understand what's really happening spiritually and theologically underneath it. We have a situation now where a member of the U.S. Congress from Georgia, Mr. Lewis, who was attacked by racist thugs in Selma, Alabama, is now behaving like a racist himself, like a bigot himself. Somebody who once fought for the inclusion of blacks in the government process is now fighting for the exclusion. This is absurd. But cognitive dissonance demands it. No, it must be about race. She lost because of the Russians. She lost because of the vote miscount. She lost because of the FBI. They'll always have to find some reason, some excuse, not to come to terms with the facts. The facts are that twice as many blacks voted for Mr. Trump than voted for Mr. Romney. Well, let's look at this even further now. I'll take three examples. Louis Farrakhan, a leader of the Nation of Islam, a black racist. Watch him on television, watch him on YouTube. So you Democrats, you've been in that party a long time. Answer me, what did you get? You got a president. He's worried about his legacy. Well, you want Hillary to get in to protect your legacy because Trump said the minute he get in, he's going to reverse 
the Affordable Care Act. Because that's your signature achievement. Mm -hmm. To show you how hateful the enemy is, he hates that you achieved what you did achieve. So he said, I'm, I'm going to tear it up when I get in. So he don't want his legacy destroyed. Mr. President, let the man do if he get in what he want. Because he's not destroying your legacy. If your legacy is bound up in an Affordable Care Act that only affects a few million people and they're trying to make it really difficult for those of us who signed up, that's not your legacy. But I just want to tell you, Mr. President, you from Chicago and so am I. I go out in the street with the people. I visited the worst neighborhoods. I talked to the gangs. And while I was out there talking to them, they said, you know, Farrakhan, the president ain't never come. Could you get him to come and look after us? There's your legacy, Mr. President. It's in the street with your suffering people, Mr. President. And if you can't go and see about them, then don't worry about your legacy. How many of you voting for Hillary? You don't have to raise your hands. I do not blame you for wanting a female president. But that's a wicked woman. Then you have Mr. Lewis and these people and Van Johnson saying, oh, this is a white lash, it's because of white people. Wait a minute, Barricane's not white, he's anti-white. Barricane can be watched on YouTube, on the media, openly saying to black people, Barack Obama's done nothing in his two terms except serve white people. Because the white people that you've served so well, they'll preserve your legacy. But you didn't earn your legacy with us. We put you there. You fought for the rights of gay people. No legacy. His legacy should be with the black people on the streets of Chicago, in the poor neighborhoods. He has no legacy. He's only served white people. Now that's a black man. And it's a radical black, an anti-white black, a racist black. Somebody with the racist Islamic philosophy that combines racism with Islam. That even other Muslims reject it generally. Oh no, we, we ignore that. We have to ignore that. Ellis will ignore that. Uh, you know, Jesse Jackson will ignore that. Uh, Sharpton will ignore that. Congressman Lewis will ignore that. It doesn't fit the narrative. Now they know it's true. Cognitive dissonance. Bill Clinton tripled the Afro-American prison population. I'll, I'll tell you a couple of stories about, about fraud. fraud. We're going to ignore that. Don't factor that into the equation. Just leave it out. Yeah, but it's true. It doesn't fit the narrative. We're going with this, with the identity issue. Well, let's look at another one. Cornell West, Dr. Cornell West, social democrat, a socialist, much closer in his thinking to Bernie Sanders than to Hillary Clinton, nonetheless, a well left-wing figure in the Afro-American community and a black academic who writes well. He actually does write quite well. He has good writing skills. He says that Barack Obama was there for Wall Street, not for the black people. He's done nothing to help them. He was there for Wall Street. And particularly President Obama living up to the promises that he made when he became president. Well, I think that uh, he has now aligned himself with forces that promote the abandonment of poor people and the neglect of working people. 
So I would characterize Obama as a charismatic version of American exceptionalism with a Keynesian neoliberalism at home and a liberal neoconservatism abroad, which is to say he's the friendly face of the American empire abroad. And internally, he's a centrist now leaning toward the right. And he's in the process, actually, of becoming, very sadly, a, a pawn of big finance and a, a puppet of big business. And that's a very sad assessment because he's began with such magnificent democratic rhetoric during the campaign. And he's right. Barack Obama bailed out Wall Street, but what did he do for his own people? Put them on the breadline? A 58% increase in the number of blacks on food stamps? Nobody can deny that. Cornell West wrote it and said it. We're going to ignore it. Jackson will ignore it. Sharpton will ignore it. Lewis will ignore it. They will all ignore it. It doesn't fit the narrative. It threatens the lie that they built their house on. This is cognitive dissonance. Now another left center black, the journalist Tavis Smiley. In his article, written in uh, the Huffington Post, Cornell West article was in The Guardian, but the Huffington Post published the article by Tavis Smiley. It is true that uh, over these last 10 years, most of that on his watch, black America has lost ground in the major economic indicator categories. Every major economic indicator, black Americans are not better off after two terms of Obama. In fact, they're worse off. Black home ownership, real unemployment, once you look at the labor participation rate, is astronomical. Unemployment among black youth, they have never had it so bad in terms of key sectors such as home ownership and the amount of blacks on the breadline, that is food stamps. Oh no, 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 Barack Obama is the first black president, we're going to ignore that. Cognitive dissonance. They know it's true, but they think that by ignoring a truth, it will somehow magically disappear or go away or fail to have any ramification. They think by running away from the truth, they can run away from the consequences of the truth, but they cannot. This is cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance. And the irrational degrees people will go to to justify it. Now, I'm only speaking about what pro-Obama and left-wing black leaders have said about Obama. The more conservative ones, such as Professor Walter Williams, Mason University, or Dr. Thomas Sowell, they'll tell you the real truth. <laughs> Herman Cain, the mathematician and rocket scientist turned successful businessman, will tell you the real truth. It's worse than what the others are telling you. The president has gone from assuming that the American people are gullible to assuming that the American people are simply stupid. Donald Trump may say some things that irritate people, but he never assumes that people are stupid or gullible. That's the difference between what Donald Trump said and what the president said, Neil. Plain and simple. These were black people. Oh no, we're going to ignore it. It's only white racism. What do you mean? Is Farrakhan is, is, is white, is a white racist? Cornell West is a white racist? Tava Smiley is a white racist? This is absurd. Cognitive dissonance, the capacity to be irrational, is unbelievable. Again, a missing seat at a presidential inauguration. Mr. Lewis's seat reserved for him, and he pins a sign on it, white only. It's the same man who fought for black inclusion, who fought segregation, who fought Jim Crow, and now he becomes a proponent of the very things he fought against, black disinclusion and the political process. This is sad, but it is cognitive dissonance. Let's look at the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was based on the Marxist presupposition that came essentially from dialectic materialism. 
As capitalism evolved from feudalism, so too communism would evolve from capitalism. Writing from here in London, Karl Marx said, communism and communist uprising of the proletariat will begin in Great Britain because it was the first capitalist country. He said it would never work in Russia. Russia is too primitive. It's still feudal. Instead, the diametric opposite happened. Britain never turned to full-fledged communism. It resisted it. Communism began in Russia, not the first of the capitalist countries, the last of the feudal ones. The model was fundamentally wrong. The Hegelian dialectic was fundamentally wrong with the thesis, the antithesis, and the synthesis. The model broke down. Nonetheless, the old men in the Kremlin had a vested interest in perpetuating the status quo. They had to bang on the same drum and perpetuate the same narrative. Why? Cognitive dissonance. They couldn't face the reality that communism didn't work. It was not egalitarian. It did not give a higher standard of living to the workers. It was the countries they protested against. For all of the injustices of capitalism, still capitalism gave a higher degree of prosperity and personal and political freedom to the proletariat than communism did, to the working people than communism did. Oh no, that doesn't fit the narrative. We're going to ignore it and keep up with the same story. Nobody believes it. I went to China a number of times. I remember driving through a tunnel in Shanghai with Pepsi Cola signs on the entrance to the tunnel where the toll booth was. This is communism? The economy was not communist. Only the party claimed to be communist, but it wasn't. <laughs> they knew communism didn't work, but officially they said it did. It's not even rational to go to China and pretend it's anything but cutthroat capitalism. It's an abuse of capitalism. Yet, the party claims to be communist. It's not even rational. Why? Cognitive dissonance. If you look at Darwinism, Darwinism gave rise to Hegelian dialectic, the idea of the evolution, the thesis, the antithesis, and the synthesis. When you ask any Darwinist, show me one place, one place where recombinant DNA mutates across the genus barrier in the natural environment to the advancement of another species, they can't show it to you. The closest they can come is something like a bacteriophage, a virus that attaches itself to a bacterial cell, disconnects itself, and transplants the nucleic acids into a host cell, but it works for the destruction of it, not its advancement. It's bioentropy. You ask them, there was no information science in the age of Charles Darwin. There is now. Where does information come from a vacuum? A very sophisticated computer code would be 100,000 lines of digital information. Just the four nucleotides in the human genome is 13 billion, and that's just the human one that has to begin to interface with the genome of other species in a very complex environment. How can this possibly be? You have computer programs that can write other computer programs, but somebody still had to write the first program. There must be a design. An intelligent design must be there. They can't deny this on the grounds of information science. Oh no, it doesn't fit the narrative. These silly Darwinists of today are like the medieval Roman Catholic Church trying to condemn the discoveries and determinations of Kepler, Galileo, and Copernicus of the heliocentric solar system. 
Now, there's nothing in Scripture that says that the Earth was the center of our solar system. It all came from Ptolemaic astronomy, but it was still part of their worldview. So people like Galileo and Copernicus faced persecution. They faced excommunication by the Roman Catholic Church. But wait a minute, here are the calculations. Here are the realities. We don't care what the realities are. It doesn't fit the narrative. When Pope issued a papal encyclical condemning the discoveries of modern science in the 19th century. That's how ridiculous it is. Today, the defenders of Darwinism are doing the same thing. Completely irrational. It doesn't fit the narrative. It's an inconvenient set of facts we don't want to deal with. Proponents of global warming do the same thing. Proponents of global warming do the same thing. They only look at certain facts that supports their thesis. They don't want to deal with the fact that there have been cyclical mete meteorological changes for centuries that we know of historically. Why did the Vikings call Iceland Iceland instead of Greenland when it's mostly green? And why did they call Greenland Greenland when it's mostly ice? <laughs> no, that doesn't fit the narrative. Wait a minute. Plants need carbon the way that we need oxygen. That doesn't fit the narrative. Cognitive dissonance. They'll always yell, oh, industries who have a vested interest in polluting to make money are hiring scientists to put out false information or to discredit studies. Yeah. One of their own major studies at Norwich University was completely discredited. They don't want to know about it. Cognitive dissonance. This extends into the religious realm, not just the political one. It goes not just in the science of the environment or in the science of biological evolution as it's claimed. It doesn't just go against Darwinism. It's in everything, not least of all religion. You could have an educated Hindu in England who's a professional person. They will accept the fact that drinking water from the Ganges can cause cholera. There are people who practice village Hinduism in India that if you told them it's bacterially infested, don't drink that water. No, it's holy! Now, wait a minute, we can show you micro slides and we can show you the... We don't want to see it! Don't do it. I've seen this many times in Islam speaking to Muslims and speaking to preachers of Islam. When you bring up what the Hadith tells us and the Quran tells us about Muhammad, he forced his son, his stepson, to divorce his wife so he could take her. And then allegedly, it says, they claim, Allah told him not to take any more wives, but he did. Well, if he forced his son to divorce his wife so he could take his son's wife, and then Allah told him not to take any more. Why did he keep taking wives? We don't want to talk about that. It doesn't fit the narrative. He's the prophet. Well, wait a minute. He married Aisha, the daughter of Abu Bakir, when she was a little girl. He took her virginity when she was nine. He was a pedophile. It's in your own literature. We don't want to talk about it. He's the prophet. We can't deal with it. Well, what about Ummah? There's no Ummah in the, in, in, in the Muslim world. Most jihads are Muslims killing each other. Not the infidel, as you put it. Why is this if Muslims are one nation and one people? There is no Umar that indicts it. It proves the scriptures are correct. That Esau's sword will be against his brother, and Ishmael's seed will always be divided. Look here. We don't want to see it! It goes against the narrative. Allahu Akbar, Muhammad is the prophet. Just like Orbels, repeat the lie often enough till people will think it's the truth to the point they can't think. And if you do provoke them with the truth and you do confront them with facts, they can't come to terms with it. They're afraid of the consequences socially or with family or sometimes 
for fear of their own lives. Certainly in the Muslim world that happens. They just can't deal with it. So they reinvest in the lie, knowing that they're not really sure, but they pretend they are to cope with their insecurity. Well, let's look at Catholicism. The Fatima letters were finally disclosed and opened up. And it showed a pope being shot by in a drawings by military soldiers, and it had a prophecy that the First World War would end the next day. In other words, this nun at Fatima, who supposedly saw the Virgin Mary and got this message, prophesied falsely. She predicted things that didn't happen. Oh no, Our Lady of Fatima, Mary came there. Yeah, but look, it's all rubbish. Oh no, Our Lady of Fatima. It just doesn't fit the narrative. Doesn't fit the narrative. Wait a minute. The Romans crucified through the radius, as we pointed out the other day, not the metacarpal, the radius. We can prove it with archaeology. We can prove it with medical pathology. We can prove it. The stigmata cannot be real. That's not where Jesus was pierced. Oh no, Padre Pio! The stigmata, it doesn't fit the narrative. Yeah, but these are the facts. That film Spotlight, just over 1,500 priests in Boston alone. 1,500 in Boston alone caught up in some kind of pedophilia. We don't want to see it! But St. Paul says it's the doctrine of demons to forbid marriage. We don't want to see it! It doesn't fit the narrative. The priests are holy men of God. Will you deal with the facts? Every diocese in the United States has been found culpable in court, legally liable. They spend hundreds of millions and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars on out-of-court settlements and law fees. We don't want to see it! They just run away. It doesn't fit the narrative. No, the Roman Church is the one true church. The Pope is the heir of Peter. No, he isn't. I can show you. We don't want to see it! Cognitive dissonance. They reinvest in something they're really not sure is true in something that they have reasonable grounds to seriously doubt. But insecurity, family, and admitting they were wrong their whole lives, <laughs> a Muslim or a Catholic, I've dealt with this in Judaism. I remember in 1991, Menachem Schneerson, the Lubavitch rabbi, claimed by his disciples to be the Messiah, said the Messiah would arrive before Yom Kippur, in 1991, and the sign of that was that Israel's cities were not destroyed by Saddam Hussein in the war with Iraq, Desert Storm. And his followers believed it. So I went to the Hasidic neighborhood in London with gospel tracts the next day after Yom Kippur, and after, sorry, after Rosh Hashanah. He said Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, Yom Kippur, they were in 10 days of each other. I went up there with some friends who we were giving out tracts, and I confronted rabbis from the Lubavitch movement. And I said, look, Schneerson said he was going to be here. Read what Moshe Rabbeinu said in Deuteronomy 18. He's a false prophet. According to the Torah, he's a false prophet. Deuteronomy 18. We don't want to see it. It doesn't fit the narrative. He's the Rebbe. <laughs> Facts don't matter. Truth doesn't matter. They have to reinvest in something they're really not sure they believe in. I had an Orthodox rabbi in front of up by Lincoln Center Synagogue a number of years ago on the street, and we had a kind of a chat that turned into a debate. And I was showing him Daniel 9, the Messiah had to come before the Second Temple would be destroyed. Finally, he was angry, and he said, give me a better source than Daniel. I said, wait a minute, you just told me you believe Daniel was a prophet of God. You want a better source than God? Doesn't fit the narrative. Don't talk to me. Don't tell me. 
It gets almost ridiculous with Mormons. Journal of Discourses of Brigham Young, Volume 17. There's Quakers living on the moon uh, the, and, on, and, and on the sun, according to Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, Quakers living on the moon. This is crazy. Look at it. You wouldn't understand. We don't want to deal with it. I've got a burden in my bosom, and I testify to you the Church of Latter-day Saints is true. They resort to their so-called testimony. You show them the evidence. You show them it's rubbish. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. This is what secular psychologists and sociologists call cognitive dissonance. Another example is obviously the Jehovah's Witnesses. Multiple, multiple predictions, multiple of the end of the world. Completely wrong, repeatedly and serially, going back to 1915, 1914, and 1915. 1975, before the end of World War I, before the end of World War II. Look, your leaders keep predicting things that don't happen. They're false prophets. We don't want to know. It doesn't fit the narrative. Cognitive dissonance. They reinvest in the lie. Now, even the world recognizes this. <coughs> there was a secular social psychologist called Leon Festinger, who was very interested in the psychology of religion, and he identified the phenomena, quantified it even. Um, they've always known it. They've always known what cognitive dissonance is. But they can't come to terms with explaining why it's there. They just try to put it down to some kind of insecurity. Let's look at the facts. In the new South Africa, since Nelson Mandela was released from Robbins Island, and I say this as somebody who was opposed to apartheid, I was opposed to it, I thought it was racist and unjust. But it's a country that has replaced one evil with another. Black unemployment has more than doubled. Black underemployment is incalculable. Black infant mortality has skyrocketed. Black longevity has plummeted. The average black person is far worse off. The white people who know how to run the infrastructure are leaving the country because of the crime. They raped and destroyed the country. The ANC has made a mess of everything. Blacks are worse off now in terms of the essentials of life than they were under an unjust racist system. You tell them this, you show the facts. We don't want to see it. We don't want to know. That doesn't fit the narrative. That's all racist propaganda. No, it's not. These are facts. You point out that after 1967, when the Israelis were forced in self-defense, to conquer Gaza and the West Bank in self-defense, forced to conquer it in self-defense. According to the World Health Organization, the standard of living in Gaza among Arabs under the Israelis went up 370%. And again, we're talking the essentials of life, employment, longevity, infant mortality. 370% improvement under the Israelis in Gaza and 320% improvement in the West Bank. Oh no, the Israelis are running a concentration camp. No, they're not. Hamas is. But here's the facts. Once the Israelis left, look what happened. It's all declined again. And it's not the fault of the Israelis. They're not blocking food and medicine. They're only searching the food and medicine to make sure there's no weapons from Iran coming in. Oh no, that doesn't fit the narrative. Identity politics, the feminists do it, the, 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 the racial politicians, the, the, the racocrats do it, they, they all do it. And religions do it. But what happens when somebody says they're born again? Their fever is skyrocketing. They're not getting well. And they begin saying, my body's lying to me. I claim this healing in the name of Jesus. There are people who have died from that. I had a close friend in New York City who died from that word faith teaching. Died! 
my people perish for a lack of knowledge. Saved Christians are just as capable of cognitive dissonance. No revival ever came from Toronto, Canada, Pensacola, Florida, or Lakeland, Florida. Only scandal and decline. No revival. It was not like the Jesus movement of the 1960s and early 70s. There was no revival. You can show them the statistics, the Barna reports or the Briley reports. Yeah, there's no revival. That doesn't fit the narrative. It was a revival. There's a revival. It's still happened. Hallelujah. They're delusional. They're not just blind. They're willfully blind, as blind as the rabbis, as blind as the Muslims, as blind as the cults, like the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses, as blind as the Church of Rome. Cognitive dissonance. But psychology doesn't really know why. The Word of God tells us why. Look with me, please, to Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, in one place. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. What will my family think if I accept Jesus for an Orthodox Jew? And I know many Orthodox Jews have had to deal with this. There are people in our ministry, their own families, have sat shiva for them, have had funerals. I know Muslims who've gotten saved. They can't go to their families. Their families would kill them. These are people who faced the truth and dealt with it by God's grace. Instead, people embrace what was false when they reject the truth. They cement themselves to it inextricably. Paul tells us the God of this world has blinded their eyes. What is really on back of cognitive dissonance is not purely behavioral. The behavioral is a result of something spiritual. The fallen nature of man in concert with the works of the devil has deceived them. They are spiritually deceived. The fact that they are intellectually deceived, emotionally manipulated into not reasoning and not thinking, not dealing with the facts, that is simply a ramification of spiritual deception. Psychology can tell you this cognitive dissonance, and they're right, but they can't tell you why. The Word of God can. It happens in the secular world. It happens in religion. But what I'm concerned about is when it happens among believers, saved Christians, supposedly, believing in counterfeit revivals, believing in proven false teachers and false prophets. Well, let's look at a second phenomena, well identified by secular psychology, the Donington Kruger effect. This is a big deal. The Donington Kruger effect. Essentially, the Donington Kruger effect says highly intelligent people are more cautious and tend to underestimate their own abilities. Highly intelligent people are more cautious and have a tendency to underestimate their own abilities. That doesn't mean that they're indecisive, but it just means they will not make a move until they are sure, unless they have to. The Donington Kruger effect also says that highly intelligent people tend to assume other people are as intelligent as they are and can understand them when they're writing something or saying something, which may or may not be the case. At the same time, the Donington Kruger effect says less intelligent people, people with lower intelligence, often with lower education, 
tend to think more emotionally. They're predisposed to thinking emotionally instead of logically. Can be more easily manipulated, of course, as a result of that. But they tend to overestimate their own ability. They tend to think they can do things that they really cannot. Look at South Africa, the ANC. Just give us black power, we can run this place. Don't they ran it into the ground? There was not enough educated middle class blacks to do that. They would have needed one to two generations without apartheid to train up a black cadre of professional people who could run the infrastructure and the economy. But there wasn't that. People of lower intelligence, less education, will always tend or have a propensity to overestimate their own ability and find themselves out of their league and not able to do the job. People of higher intelligence are much more cautious. They will tend to underestimate themselves, but tend to overestimate others, interestingly enough. Now let's look what the scripture says about this. I have no doubt that the Donington-Kruger effect is right. But it doesn't have to be that way. We're told in Proverbs 17, 28, even a fool, when he keeps silent, is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he's considered prudent, or in some translations, intelligent. Not being formally educated does not by any means someone lacks common sense or that they're stupid. But if somebody is not formally educated or knowledgeable of a subject or ignorant in a field, if they do have common sense, they will keep their mouth shut and not misrepresent themselves as knowing things they do not. Neither will they misrepresent themselves as having capabilities they do not. Now, for those who have those capabilities, take caution. That makes you the servant, not just the leader. And it means where much is given, much is expected. A familiar passage we always point to. 2 Peter 3, verses 15 and 16. And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. Let us look again, as I've always said when I look at this passage, at the humility of Peter. I'm a fisherman, Paul is a rabbi. He is a Greco-Roman intellectual with Roman citizenship. He has an education I do not have. He is better equipped to explain these things than me. These things are complicated and difficult. While I understand them, Paul is better to explain them. Now that did not mean his own apostolic authority one bit, and in fact reflected nobly on his character and his humility. But look what else he says, that the untaught and unstable distorts. Donington Kruger. They think they know more than they do. They think they can do things they can't. You look at the hype artist preaching that is not exposition, but simply motivational speaking combined with hype. The things that go on in Hillsong, the things that go on with Carl Lins and these people. They have no real biblical compass for where they're going. When you look at the scriptures, they're not exegetically handling them very well. In fact, they're handling them badly very often. They're biblically ignorant in any doctrinal or theological sense. But they think they know more than they do. They're simply entertainers. They're running a three-ring circus thinking it's a church with the naked cowboy dancing at a Christian women's conference and cheerleaders running around with flags. They think this is worship. It's ugly, it's absurd. And they can always find some passage out of context 
to justify it. The untaught and unstable. All I need is Jesus, hallelujah. All I need is the Spirit. He leads me into all truth, hallelujah. And so they stand there and wait for a revelation. Whatever comes into their head, they think that's the Lord speaking to them. They forget about study to show yourself approved. The illumination of the Holy Spirit through prayerful study. These are ignorant people. This is what the world calls, what secular psychology defines as the Donington Kruger effect. But they can't tell you why. It has to do with the sins of pride. And again, it has to do with the hand of the devil. That's what it is. The world can identify it. But the world cannot tell you why. The world knows there's wars. It's the epistle of James that tells you why there's wars. And that's not just for the world. James says wars among you. Fights among believers. Not motivated by upholding truth or righteousness, but motivated by self-ambition and the church. We'll come back to that. So we have the cognitive dissonance, and we have the Donington-Kruger effect. A third term that any psychologist will be familiar with is functional autonomy. Functional autonomy is when the means to an end becomes an end in itself. Let's say hypothetically in the American Rust Belt in the Midwest somewhere, a man who worked on an assembly line was made redundant. His job was exported to China or to Mexico. And he says, I'm never going to trust a corporation again. I'm going to work for myself and go in business for myself. So this guy takes his redundancy package, opens a small business, and he struggles and struggles. And he says, I'm never going to have my family reliant on my paycheck from somebody else again. I'm going to take personal responsibility and be my own boss. And he works hard. And the first few years are tough. And he's battling to get a line of credit. Then he's battling to meet payroll. Then he's battling to meet tech taxes. He's battling to maintain a competitive edge. But he says, I gotta do this for my family. I gotta do this for my family. And he does it. He eventually turns the corner and the business begins to prosper. Slowly but steadily at first, but then it gains momentum. But then something happens. The means to an end becomes an end in itself. No, I can't take little Hank to the ball game today. I have a meeting at 2 o'clock on Saturday. Yeah, but it's the weekend. You spend it with the kids. I can't do that anymore. <laughs> well, that can happen one week, two weeks. But what happens when it happens most, most weeks? The business consumes him. Something that he set out to do for his family becomes the end in itself, and he sacrifices his family for the sake of the business. The world would identify this as functional autonomy. Functional autonomy. This can and does get into the church. Now let's look at this, functional autonomy. Look with me as one example. Look at Luke chapter 10, please, verses 38 to 41. Now as they were traveling along, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary, Miriam, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations. And she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, 
which shall not be taken away from her. This is an interesting passage. Now, both in the English translation and in the Greek, the Lord's rebuke was not a strong one. That tells us the Lord is gracious to his people when this happens. But what happens is this. Functionally, the work of the Lord becomes more important than the Lord of the work. The work of the Lord becomes more important than the Lord of the work. She's running around doing things that need to be done. But her sister wants to sit at Jesus' feet and hear what he's saying. Now, this is not to say we should be slack in doing the Lord's work. Scriptures tell us, cursed is he who is slack in going about the king's business. But what happens when the ministry becomes an idol? It doesn't begin that way. The ministry does not become an idol. When you see these people get caught up in building projects and things like this, the building may not be wrong. but it becomes not something that God told them to do to serve the Lord. It becomes a monument to themselves and their own legacy and their own ministry. They're not building a ministry. They're building a monument to themselves. How does that begin? It doesn't begin by self-glorification. It begins by letting the work of the Lord become more important than the Lord of the work. I've got a lot to do every day. This is a battle I have. I have secular business things, support my family and so forth, and I have the ministry. And I'm handicapped. I'm very busy. My battle is I have to sit at Jesus' feet, finding that time for prayer and reading his word is a battle because of the pressures of things I have to do. It can happen to any of us. These are things that are valid, necessary. But sitting at his feet is even more necessary. It's not one at the expense of the other. But there is an order of priorities. Your sister has chosen the better things. Your work, my work, your ministry, my ministry, necessary, important, yes. But the most important thing in my day or your day will be sitting at the feet of Jesus. Then comes the rest. And you'll be surprised at how efficient and fast it can get done when you make him and sitting at his feet the priority. It is so easy to confuse serving the Lord in such a way as the work of the Lord becomes more important than the relationship with him. Now again, the Lord did not rebuke her strongly, but it was a rebuke. And in fairness, elsewhere with the death of Lazarus, we see that it was rather uh, her sister who lost her faith. Uh, it was not her. She said, Lord, I know even now you can raise my brother up. Other times, she saw, she saw extreme spirituality. But in this instance, there was a problem. And it's not a problem that was peculiar to her. It's a problem we all face, especially those in ministry and in leadership. The world can call it functional autonomy. We have to have a ministry to preach the gospel, to help the poor, to help the persecuted church, to teach the word of God, to make disciples. Yes, but what happens when the means to an end becomes an end in itself? When the ministry of serving the Lord becomes more important than the relationship with him, functionally and in our priorities. Quite a thing. We have to be led by the Lord in this. And again, his rebuke was not harsh. But let us take this into account and be warned. 
we can serve the Lord in the flesh. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Our works are going to be judged. Our sin was judged on the cross. Now, this is not hell damning. He's not saying you're going to hell. <laughs> Our sin was judged on the cross. What he's saying is, are the works we're doing wrought of God or of ourselves? There's always a difference between a good idea and a God idea. I've had a lot of good ideas. That didn't necessarily make them God ideas. Even our good ideas have to be brought to the cross. Lord, there's this need. Are you calling me to meet it? We have to be motivated by the Lord, not the need. Now, when we act in the flesh, God may still use us because he's a gracious God and he's concerned for others. Our works will be burned up. I've seen many, many Christian organizations and many Christians giving money to Christian Zionist organizations that don't preach the gospel. Now, there are some good Christian Zion organizations which are evangelistic in a low-key way. There are others, however, that have signed agreements not to evangelize Jews, to withhold the bread of life. Go to hell, Jew, without your Messiah. We love you in Jesus' name. I would not go near some of these organizations. I warn people about the International Christian Embassy. I warn people about Bridges for Peace. I warn people about Exobus and about these ones bringing the Jews back on boats but have signed agreements not to give them the gospel. Would Peter or Paul ever withhold the gospel? In the name of Zionism? Oh, but you're called to do that. We're called to do this. Where? The scriptures predict the Lord, the Lord would cause the Jews to come back to Israel. But where does it say that we are the ones who have to bring them back? Well, he says there's going to be hunters and fishers. Yes. Interpreted in light of the New Testament, fishers of men. I'm not saying to those people, everybody has to evangelize Jews in a high-profile manner. Many Jews are saved by people befriending them and sharing the gospel with them privately in a low-key manner. That's appropriate for expatriates. It's the local congregations in Israel who should be high-profile. But when you're not evangelizing Jews at all, or when you're venturing into the heresy of dual covenant theology and saying they don't have to be saved, well, you're coming out with the things that John Hagee comes out with, that Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. This is wrong. Their motives may be sincere, but their works will be burned up. Now again, Jesus' rebuke was not staunch. And Paul says these people's error is not held at me but they think they're serving the Lord, and they're really not. There were many sick people at Bethesda, but the Lord only healed the one his father told him to. Other places, he healed multiple people. We have to be careful, very careful. So much of the work of the Lord today is done in the flesh. People are being motivated by needs instead of by God. Now, again, the Lord is gentle in his rebuke of such people, and we should be gentle in our rebuke of some of them, not the leaders who are misleading them necessarily, but the people who are being taken in. Christians get caught up in functional autonomy. When the work of the Lord becomes more important than the Lord of the work, when that happens, we get into doing work that's not ordained of the Lord. It may not be bad. It may seem to be of the Lord. Be careful of organizations with a social gospel that don't preach salvation. That's a sure mark. They don't deserve your prayers or support. Pray that they clean up the rack and begin preaching salvation, repentance, second birth. Donington Kruger Never be jealous of another person's ministry or calling. 
be faithful to your own. Peter was one of the 12, Paul wasn't. Our stature and our standing does not have to do with how much God uses us. It has to do with how faithful we are to Jesus. We tend to count in terms of numbers. That's how we calibrate. God has different standards. Now, of course, we do have the bearing fruit, threefold, tenfold, and so forth. The power of the talents. Use your talents. Invest your talents. Then God will give you more. Cognitive dissonance. Perhaps one of the most cognitively dissonant passages of Scripture is in Ezekiel 33. For 15 years after the Babylonians destroyed the temple, as Jeremiah predicted, for 15 years afterwards, Ezekiel continued to prophesy. But even after that happened, even after Isaiah and Joel and Jeremiah were vindicated, Ezekiel tells us the people still clung on to the lie, the false belief, the false hope. When the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, they were confronted with the fact that Daniel said the Messiah would come and die before 70 AD. And so they clung on to a false Judaism that they're holding on to until this day. This is a big problem. Thank God many Jews are seeing Yeshua, Jesus, as the Messiah and realizing that he's come. The world can identify these things with its psychology and its sociology. The world knows about functional autonomy. The world knows about Donning D. Kruger. And the world knows about cognitive dissonance. The pseudo-psychology of the world is not biblical psychology. Biblical psychology, as I've said, is grounded largely in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is an index, a key to biblical typology, but it's also divine psychology. If you want to understand human behavior, read Proverbs. It understands the three-dimensional nature of man, his spiritual component. Secular psychology reduces it to two, as does Eastern religion, confusing psychology with the spirit. This happens in shamanism, Hinduism, Buddhism. It happens with Yang Yi Chao, the, the convicted swindler in Korea. But scripturally, they're distinct. There's three. Yes, the world knows about cognitive dissonance. The world knows through its psychology about Donington Kruger, and the world knows about functional autonomy. They know about these things, but they don't know what causes these delusions. These delusions are caused by sin. They find a fertile field for planting these delusions in the fallen nature of man and Satan has plenty of seeds to plant in the fallen nature of man cognitive dissonance Donington Kruger functional autonomy secular psychology can tell you what they are but secular psychology cannot tell you why they are the word of God can. When the world gets caught up in these things, you should expect it. In the political realm, in the realm of science with the Darwinism, in the realm of religion, in the realm of cults. But born again believers in Jesus, we need to go beyond these things and not be caught up in them. We need to realize what the scripture tells us. Cognitive dissonance, Donington Kruger, and functional autonomy. The word of God knew about those things long before the pseudoscience of secular psychology. 
My name is Jacob Prash. Thank you so much for listening. God bless and thank you. Dear friends, greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon, and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. First being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea. It's an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, shadows of the beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo, Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morial catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.